widely read and influential weekly periodicals of his day. Uh, that called, one was called the Irish Homestead and the other the Irish Statesman are now collected in three large, very fat volumes <laughs> published by Colin Smythe, uh, which we've only glanced at. In addition, Russell's life cannot be well encapsulated or summarized. Behind each song, there are notes not heard and verses too precious to sing. Even the biographies written by those who knew him seem to provide but partial glimpses through distorted lenses. Russell's public life was a paradise in motion, touching the lives of famous movers of literature, art, and politics, and many others uncounted and names unknown. But that seems to be only the visible portion of an enormous iceberg. Ours will likewise be a partial sketch, whilst precariously perched on the shoulders of giants. And those giants are in the form of two main books uh, from which the material for this forum has been drawn. First and foremost is The Descent of the Gods, comprising the mystical writings of George William Russell, A.E., edited by the two founders of the Institute of World Culture, Nandini and Raghavan Iyer. It is the only literary work of this magnitude that was co-edited and authored by them. Completed in 1978, but not published until uh, 1988, this neglected volume of diligent scholarship and spiritual insight is an example of the Iyer's tireless devotion and collaboration. With a 78-page introduction and over 100 pages of footnotes, it includes a brilliant and succinct summation of the non-sectarian mystical philosophy of which both Russell and the Iyer's were luminous expounders. And it brings together all the mystical prose of Russell into one volume, one collection, arguably the heart and essence of his contribution to the Irish literary renaissance. In my view, this is the finest and most penetrating overview you will ever find of Russell's mystical quest. That quest, as mentioned in their preface, was, quote, to bridge eternity and time. Russell is vibrantly portrayed here as uh, not only belonging to a long lineage of the, quote unquote, the homeless tribe of mystics and spiritual exiles, but also as a true hero and seer whose, quote, greatness of soul and love for humanity was exemplified in his calm renunciation of personal goals and single-minded commitment to a life of altruistic service. Secondly, we are drawing from the work of Henry Summerfield, published in 1974, called That Myriad-Minded Man, a biography of G.W. Russell, A.E. In the opening chapter, a two-paragraph summary of Russell's life is cast. Mystic and patriot, poet and discoverer of poets, painter, journalist, practical rural economist, and proponent of a more humane social order. And by the way, we're going to be showing, you'll see as we go through the slides, there's probably maybe a dozen or maybe two dozen uh, Im painted images, and those are all Russell's uh, paintings. But Summerfield warns us that especially when inserted into historical context, none of his activities were insignificant. And, quote, no resume of his achievements does justice to him or explains why he was for so many years one of the best loved men in Ireland. His greatest accomplishment was the creation of his own character, unquote. This helps to explain the extraordinary affection bordering on hero worship, which he inspired in the most diverse persons. Not only does Russell glowingly appear in the memoirs of dozens of his talented literary contemporaries, but was beloved by countless common folk, including hesitant soldiers who knocked at his door in Dublin, seeking his blessing before they joined the troops in World War I. To some, he was both sage and saint. 
never having been to college. Such were his insights into both literature and the practical details of social and political reform that in later life he was given two honorary doctorates, one from Yale and one from Trinity College in Dublin. He was offered a position in the Senate, uh, which he refused as Ireland gained its independence and was repeatedly consulted by two British prime ministers. In 1934, age 67, he was called to Washington, pleaded to come to Washington to personally advise President Roosevelt and Henry Wallace, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, among other senators and legislators, regarding the national crisis of 20 million unemployed. Clearly, his prophet-like ardor was combined with the capacity of enabling others to share his own vision. Moreover, he had the rare ability, not only through his writing and painting, but by his presence and words, to impart a living, visceral sense of the divine dimensions of nature and of the noble grandeur enshrined in human purpose. Summerfield documents how A.E.'s overflowing magnanimity found friends everywhere, many who left his company feeling enchanted and uplifted, more educated in the best sense of the word, and somehow transformed, having been ushered into a realm, quote, in which they had never before believed, unquote. George William Russell was born on April 10th, 1867, in the small Ulster town of Lurgan, Ireland, a small mar uh, market town surrounded by lush countryside. The youngest of three children, his parents were devout members of the Protest Protestant Church of Ireland with strong evangelical leanings. While little is known about his early life, in the first chapters of Song and Its Fountain, which is a collection of essays that was published in uh, 1932. Two experiences are recounted by him. Those memories were activated later in life, he wrote, as a result of the diligent practice of Pythagorean review and self-examination. And this, this is all, uh, a selection from this chapter is given in the reading that was published uh, on the IWC website is very much worth reading more than once because it's very dense. When properly cultivated, he explained, this a form of review and practice will activate latent capacities of recollection and allow us to travel back in time to the earliest years of our lives with clarity, recalling even soul memories, both inward states and outer events. Two golden moments were thus recovered by him. The first was around the age of four or five, he says, where, quote, where beauty first dawned on me, unquote. Lying in the tall grass, he became enchanted by the glittering gold of a clump of daffodils. The radiant beauty of pure color appeared as the expression of a higher mind and suffused with heavenly meaning. Because of this soul-nurturing experience, for Russell, goodness and truth would ever be linked to beauty. The second experience he relates was that which uh, opened his heart to the ethics of selfless service. Still a child, he was deeply touched by the story of a dying woman who wept a quarter of an hour before she died because she could not leave her bed to help a sick neighbor. According to Russell, both of these events repeatedly reverberated throughout his life. At the age of 10, his family moved to Dublin, and in his middle school years, Russell was recognized as having rare literary and artistic instincts. He was nicknamed the genius, winning prizes for mathematics, French, classics, English, and handwriting. He was gifted with a nearly photographic memory for the written word, and despite the sectarian focus of his education, he nurtured the imagination by his private reading of varied literature. This included the stories of Kipling and the Arabian Nights, uh, medieval romance novels, and the poetry of Tennyson. 
Around the age of 15 or 16, while on holiday, Russell underwent another spiritual awakening, beautifully described in the first chapter of The Candle of Vision. Uh, published in 1918, The Candle of Vision is a deeply moving collection of essays and Russell's most popular and acclaimed prose work. The Ayers called it, quote, the autobiography of a mystic, which stands with other timeless mystical texts as a compelling diary of the inner life, intimate yet accessible, unquote. In the first chapter titled Retrospect, uh, Russell describes the, quote, pure, holy, and beautiful experiences, unquote, which washed over him in his teens. Through them, he became distinctly aware of an eternal pilgrim, the immortal soul within his own nature, who was the true owner and heir of the body, he wrote. Though not yet purified of all worldly dross, this inner self was inextricably bound to other immortals of a like nature that he also perceived, gazing upon him from the true home of man, he, he wrote. For brief moments, he, quote, seemed to mix with their eternity, unquote. This was accompanied by a profound sense of the divine presence pervading the whole of nature. The visible world became like a tapestry blown and stirred by winds behind it. If it would but raise for an instant, I knew I would be in paradise. Every form on that tapestry appeared to be the work of gods. Every flower was a word, a thought. The grass was speech. The trees were speech, the waters were speech, the winds were speech. They were the army of the voice, marching on to conquest and dominion over the spirit. And I listened with my whole being, and then these apparitions would fade away, and I would be the mean and miserable boy once more. So might one have felt, who had been servant of the prophet, and had seen him go up in a fiery chariot, and the world had no more light or certitude in it with that passing. Russell initially thought these temporary raptures were of his own creation and ownership, but he soon realized that such vanities made him outcast. They no more belonged to him than the mountains and oceans, and in the years that followed, as he loosened his inverted grip, uh, egotistic grip, one might say, on the experience, deeper veils lifted. So did I feel one warm summer day lying idly on the hillside, not then thinking of anything but the sunlight and how sweet it was to douse there, when suddenly I felt a fiery heart throb and knew it was personal and intimate and started with every sense dilated and intent and turned inwards. And I heard first a music as of the bells going away, away into that wondrous underland whither, as the legend relates, the Danan gods withdrew. And then the heart of the hills was open to me and I knew there was no hills for those who were there and they were unconscious of the ponderous mountain piled above the palaces of light. And the winds were sparkling and diamond clear, yet full of color as an opal. And they glittered through the valley, and I knew the golden age was all about me. And it was we who had been blind to it, but it, it had never passed away from the world. When Russell left formal schooling in 1884, he was by his own account untrammeled by the least trace of skepticism, quietly guarding his desire to discover, quote, the alchemist's elixir of life and the philosopher's stone, unquote. His first love being drawing and painting, at 13 his parents had enrolled him in evening classes at the Metro uh, Metropolitan School of Art in Dublin. At 18, he also enrolled in the Royal Hiberian Academy, where he startled teachers and fellow students alike with renderings of his visionary experiences. 
He actively drew upon mythic archetypes and ancient landscapes as stimulus. The gift of seeing radiant and majestic visionary beings remained with him throughout his life, and their clear and distinct forms are preserved in many memorable sketches. Had he pursued painting with greater singularity, art critics later suggested, he might have been among the greatest painters of his era. The first two years at the Art Academy marked a turning point in several ways. Not by chance, but by a karmic law he later called spiritual gravitation, he met William Butler Yeats and Charles Johnston. Yeats was two years his senior, also at the Academy, and already a fiery poet. Like many distinguished minds of his day, Yeats Yeats's longing for spiritual nourishment was left unsatisfied by Orthodox Christianity. Though they had many differences of outlook in later years, Yeats uh, as at first was both comrade and mentor, encouraging Russell's poet, poetic explorations and introducing him to many literary circles in Dublin. Thirteen years after they met, Yeats also introduced Russell to Horace Plunkett, an educated and devoted philanthropist who partnered with Russell in a well-conceived system of rural poverty amelioration and cultural renewal. Despite his own lifelong efforts at poetic verse, Russell always considered Yeats as, quote, the best and most beautiful, unquote, poet in all of Irish literature. Charles Johnston was to become a skilled classical scholar with a working knowledge of Latin, Greek, and later Sanskrit, who had already begun translating sac sacred texts of the ancient world into English. Through Johnston and Yeats, Russell received his first introduction to Eastern philosophy and theosophical writings. This appears to have begun with the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Light of Asia by Sir Edwin Arnold, in a, which is an introduction and a story of the life of the Buddha and the Buddha's awakening. In a letter to a friend, he wrote, quote, to contain such, oh, to contain such godlike fullness of wisdom on all things, I feel the authors must have looked with calm remembrance back through a thousand passionate lives, ere they could have written with such certainty of things the soul feels to be sure. Russell was also introduced through these uh, two new friends to A.P. Sinet's work on the occult world and esoteric Buddhism along with Mabel Collins' mystical guidebook, Light on the Path. Russell was deeply inspired by the rules of discipleship and nonviolence requiring complete self-conquest and renunciation found therein. He wrote to his friend Carrie Ray that there was more religion in this little book than in the entire Old Testament. <laughs> but it was due to Isis unveiled a master key to the mysteries of ancient and modern science and theology by H.P. Blavatsky, first published in 1887, which had ignited an international intellectual fervor that Russell began to apprehend the logic of an overarching philosophical framework that helped him to interpret what he had already stumbled on through internal visions. In Blavatsky, he found that his own, quote, first crude guesses about the nature of God, unquote, corresponded to the conceptions of the early Rosicrucians, the Pythagoreans, as well as the sages of Tibet. And in doing so, he realized his kinship with countless mystics and seers throughout the ages. Later in life, Russell also became certain that spiritual verities would provide the basis for a radically new form of harmonic social and political organization. In his novel, The Interpreters, uh, it's actually a short story, a work of fiction by Russell published in 1922. He suggests that political systems and human institutions alike have their rightful hidden basis in spiritual cosmology and transcendental law. By 1885, age 18, Russell had begun immersing himself in a disciplined intellectual regimen and a deliberate fostering of his spiritual experiences through meditation. 
he longed to go to India to study under adepts. Illumined by the idea that esoteric was wisdom was the common origin and undercurrent of every great religious and philosophical tradition, he read deeply and widely. He returned to the New Testament and Plato and later explored the Chaldean oracles, Hermetic writings, the Tao Te Ching, Sufi poetry, and Celtic mythology, as well as poring over many ancient Hindu texts and their commentaries. He also extended his exposure to poetry and literature in general, including Whitman, Emerson, and Thoreau. For Whitman's Leaves of Grass, he expressed an enthusiasm almost as great as he showed for other scriptures. Quote, I looked upon Whitman as the greatest friend I have. He is the new evangelist of love and of universal brotherhood, unquote. Around the same time, Russell began a series of paintings depicting the gradual evolution of primitive humanity within the mind of God. Several of these he discarded as failures, but one picture captivated him. It was of the archetypal man newly emerging in the divine mind. Uh, as far as we know, the, the original uh, illustration has not been preserved, but this is a later mural that uh, Russell painted that we think is probably similar to what he was, uh, had depicted. And this whole uh, story is recounted again very beautifully in uh, uh, The Candle of Vision in, in a, a chapter called Imagination. Um, he was so moved by this picture that he had drawn that during a holiday in Armagh, he sat intently awake through the entire night, inwardly seeking a proper name for the image. While thus dilated, he felt a presence beyond his own mind about to speak. Finally, it whispered to him. Call it the birth of Aeon. The following day, still meditative, he glimpsed the archetypal mystery which the name evoked. It was a drama later connected with what he called the hero and man, the myth of Prometheus and divine light of Christos. These, he asserted, were in fact different names for a singular host which rebels against the mere beatitude of heaven to wrest out of the elemental chaos of human life a world for the spirit of wisdom to manifest. Two weeks later, while searching for an art journal in the Dublin library, he chanced upon an open dictionary of religions. The first word that caught his eye was aeon. It was defined there as a mystic name the Christian Gnostics used for the first beings emanated from the Godhead. He trembled. Here was confirmation that his inner communications were more than mere fancy and perhaps even recollections drawn from previous lives. When he began submitting verse and prose to public press, he signed them with the diphthong A-E, the first sound of Aeon, though it was split into the uh, initials A-E by the printer. And here we touch upon one of the key themes of the day, which was a perpetual inquiry for Russell. It is the mysterious origin, nature, right use and function of imagination. Up to this point, Russell himself was uncertain whether and in what manner the mystic experiences which washed over him were the self-deluded psychic fantasies of egotism or authentic mirrorings of divine truths. I believed then and still believe that the immortal in us has memory of all its wisdom. Or as Keats puts it in one of his letters, there is an ancestral memory in man, and we can, if we wish, drink that old wine of heaven. This memory of the spirit is the real basis of imagination. And when it speaks to us, we feel truly inspired. And a mightier creature than ourselves speaks through us. I remember how pure, holy, and beautiful these imaginations seemed how they came like crystal water, sweeping aside the muddy current of my life and the astonishment I felt. I, who was almost inarticulate, 
to find sentences which seemed noble and full of melody sounding in my brain as if another and greater than I had spoken them. And how strange it was also a little later to write without effort verse, which some people still think has beauty, while I could hardly, because my reason had then no mastery over the materials of thought, pen a prose sentence intelligently. I am convinced that all poetry is, as Emerson said, first written in the heavens. That is, it is conceived by a self deeper than appears in normal life. And when it speaks to us or tells us its ancient story, we taste of eternity and drink the soma juice, the elixir of immortality. According to the late Professor Henry Cobain, who spent his life devoted to studies in comparative philosophy, religion, and esoteric Islam, the vast and complex idea of imagination and its field of activity was called Alam al-Mithal by the Sufis. It is a multi-layered metaphysical world between the phenomenal world and that of pure unity. It is composed, he writes, of idea images, essential meanings, and confraternities of spiritual beings by which divine realities are made intelligible. Corbin cites it as an organ of knowledge which does not so much create as discover. In both Christian and Islamic mysticism as in the Theosophists and Neoplatonists of the Renaissance, he wrote, Quote, we encounter the idea that the Godhead itself possesses the power of imagination, unquote. By imagining the universe, he or it brings it into manifestation through the eternal virtualities and potencies of his own being. The more consciousness is aligned with truth and pure love, the more the act of imagination becomes a self-conscious organ of this deific, cosmogonic imagination. This coincides with what is said of the rishis of ancient India, of the Buddha, Pythagoras, and other great spiritual teachers and adepts. They were seers, not fabricators of new religions, who with a vision grown sunlike could penetrate the veils of visible nature, even witnessing the birth of suns, planets, and humanities. These are experiences beyond what language or art can express. And so we are left with myth allegory and symbol. We find all of this suggestively echoed in A.E.'s poem on karma, written in simple, accessible verse. Karma. All that was harsh or sweet to me was brought through some affinity with soul or sense or thought. I complain not nor wonder, just was my lot. I ask the wise to say, why are we heir to the wonder of the sky, the shining there? What justice gave to me this star-enchanted air? Is there still in us a heaven-descended ray of that which built the palaces of night and day? Do our first works, sun, moon, and stars, shine on our clay? Oh, how my heart leaps up. It can laugh, it could fly even in dream being knit to that majesty. Though long past from our glory, I can sing, I could fly. In 1885, Charles Johnston started the Hermetic Society in Dublin for the study of Eastern philosophy and kindred subjects. Yeats became its chairman and Russell an avid contributor other seekers, writers, poets, and mystics began to gather round. Later that same year, the group adopted a charter to establish itself as the Dublin Lodge of the Theosophical Society. Though Russell called himself a theosophist, he did not join immediately, seeking to rely more on his interior experiences. However, in addition to his deepening studies, he took occasional trips to London, where he met and experienced the brilliance of the incomparable H.P. Blavatsky, the founder of the modern theosophical movement. Russell referred to Blavatsky as, quote, a cosmos in an alien woman's body, unquote. 
At that time, Blavatsky was engaged in finishing her magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine, The Synthesis of Science, Religion, and Philosophy, published in 1888. Once it was sent to the publishers, she visited the Dublin Lodge. Um, and around this time, W.Q. Judge, who was a co-founder of the society and who was born in Dublin, also visited. Judge possessed an unmatched brilliance in translating and condensing the challenging teachings and technical language of the secret doctrine into literature more accessible to the common reader. And Russell later wrote that Judge, quote, never spoke of what he did not know and was the wisest and sweetest man he had ever met and for whom he had more reverence than any other human being, unquote. Shortly thereafter, Russell formally joined the society. For the next seven years, his life revolved around it. Besides attending thrice weekly meetings while writing poetry and prose for theosophical journals and doing his share of lecturing, A.E. became part-time vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Though he had been slower than his comrades to formally commit, once he did so, he never turned away. However, after the birth, uh, rather the death, of H.P. Blavatsky in 1891 and W.Q. Judge in 1896, Russell found the leadership of the International Society intolerably lost, as he put it. As the head of the Dublin Lodge at that time in 1896, he withdrew the charter, changed the name to the Hermetic Society, but continued to write and lecture on theosophy, nurturing other students and inquirers. From many accounts, his was never a cold repetition of doctrine, but a synthesis of intellectual acuity with poetic elocution that sought to awaken awareness of vibrant hidden realities. This continued until the last years of his life. The society which Russell led should not be confused, as it sometimes is, with the earlier group that was led by Johnston, nor with a secret society in Great Britain which Yeats had joined and which called itself the Hermetic Students of the Golden Dawn. Late in life, and despite his own extensive literary outpouring, in characteristic modesty, Russell wrote, I had no private doctrine, nothing but HPB eked out for beginners by W.Q. Judge, the Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, Patanjali, and one or two other classics. My own writing is trivial, and whatever merit is to be found in it, it is due to its having been written in a spiritual atmosphere generated by study of H.P.B. and the secret books of the East. From early on, uh, from as early as 1880, uh, Russell had decided his loyalties to his mystical commitment and his aspirations to be a painter were in conflict, and he gave up painting for a time. He took up a post as a clerk at Pym Brothers and Company, a large Dublin drapery, working nine hours a day, six days a week, making the equivalent of a mere $50 a year. But as the Irish described, this was sufficient to give him the economic security he needed during the next seven years as he poured his energies into the altruistic path of self-knowledge. His experience with the word aeon led him to believe in the divine origins of classical language roots, and he spent months brooding over the letters of the alphabet, hoping to discover their primeval meanings. In 1887, he co-authored an article with Charles Johnston entitled The Speech of the Gods, which conveyed the fruit of their explorations. Despite the hot, dreary, gas-lit interiors of Pym's, Russell's visionary experiences did not wane. These waking dreams would fall upon me at any time, while I was at work, or in the streets, or in the country roads at night. Once I was walking down a passage in the great building where I was employed over 40 years ago, a passage which led from one office to another. And in the di that dim lighted corridor, my imagination of myself was suddenly changed, and I was a child, 
and was looking upward to a dawn of faintest yellow behind snowy peaks made blue and shadowy by that glow. The mound on which I stood was brown and bare, as if it had been baked by the heat of fierce suns. The boy I had, I had become was gazing in adoration at the high and holy light. He was celestially transparent, pure and virgin. He chanted a divine name, and a fire that was heaven-born leaped from his heart. And for an instant the child was a delicate lyre whose strings quivered, echoing the song of Brahma. Then all that faded, and I was again in the offices at Pym's. And I am afraid for the moment I was not doing their work, but was finding words which might hold that remote ancestry memory. Faint grew the yellow buds of light, far flickering beyond the snow, as leaning o'er the shadowy white, morn glimmered like a pale primrose. Before that glamour had obliterated the corridor, I was intent on the work I had to do, and this interruption of vision was like the sudden flowing into a cloudy river of crystal clear water from some tributary descending from high hills. In 1891, Russell moved from his parents' home to the homestead. This was a Georgian row house which a Scottish engineer and his wife had purchased and put at the disposal of the, the Dublin Lodge and a resident community of seekers. In this congenial atmosphere, he gradually felt his weaknesses and uncertainties beginning to fall away. The seven years I lived there were the happiest in my life. How fortunate I was to be drawn into companionship with six or seven others, all, as I think, wiser and stronger than I was then. Seeds born in me began to blossom in that gracious air. And what before was but flickering of a mystic communion began to glow to almost steadfast light. Out of this companionship came all that was best in my poetry, every delicacy of perception had its growth among these friends of my youth. Russell never regretted skipping a university education for his life at the Lodge more than compensated. During his years with the homestead and beyond, he wrote of his training and self-discipline as centered on the study of the secret doctrine. This is evident in many of his articles and poems. In 1892, he res resumed painting, including murals on the walls of the lodge, every aspect of which was precisely chosen and carefully placed within the larger composition as symbolic of some aspect of the philosophy he had embraced. Despite his shyness and modesty, Russell's capacity to move audiences became evident P.L. Travers, the famed author of Mary Poppins, and Ella Young, a mythologist, poet, and author of children's books, both contributed to the Celtic literary revival. And both were among three generations of Irish writers befriended and mentored by Russell. In 1925, Miss Young emigrated to the U.S. to hold the chair at UC Berkeley for seven years in Irish myth and folklore. In her memoirs, she writes of being deeply impressed by A.E. while attending the Dublin Lodge. Quote, the tall, slender, bearded man who rose at the back of the room and who did not seem to be human, but rather the vehicle through which some being, rainbow-hued and unearthly, manifested himself, unquote. Such was P.L. Travers' love and respect for Russell that she traveled to his bedside to help nurse him in his final days. One of Russell's favorite literary forms was the aphorism in which thinkers like Blavatsky, Patanjali, and Chinese philosophers and others embodied a pro profound insight in a few brief phrases. He would often ponder over one of these sayings for weeks at a time, endeavoring to fathom its deeper meaning. To an Indian who later complimented him on his insight into Hindu thought, he replied, quote, there is nothing to be surprised at. I've had to sweat for it, unquote. 
The Bhagavad Gita became A.E.'s favorite scripture, the essence, he called it, of human wisdom, with its call to meditation, selfless devotion, and renunciation in action. It became one of the chief inspirations of his work for Ireland, as it was of Mahatma Gandhi's devoted labors for India. Its teaching lies behind many simple sayings A.E. often repeated, such as, quote, let the joy be in the doing and not in the end, unquote. The intensity of A.E.'s efforts at meditation are beautifully characterized in a chapter by that name in The Candle of Vision. There is no personal virtue in me other than this, that I followed a path all may travel, but on which few do travel. It is a path within ourselves, where the feet first falter in shadow and darkness, but which is later made gay by heavenly light. As one who has traveled a little on that way, and who has had some far-off vision of the many-colored land, if I tell what I know and how I came to see most clearly, I may give hope to those who would fain believe in that world the seers spoke of, but who cannot understand the language written. None need special gifts or genius. Gifts, ha! Ah, there are no gifts. For all that is ours, we have paid the price. Our religions make promises to be fulfilled beyond the grave because they have no knowledge now to be put to the test. But the ancients spake of a divine vision to be attained while we are yet in the body. Though I am blind, I have had moments of sight. Though I have sinned, I've been on the path. Day after day, at times where none might interfere, and where none through love or other cause were allowed to interfere, I set myself to attain mastery over the will. I would choose some mental object, an abstraction of form, and strive to hold my mind fixed on it in unwavering concentration, so that not for a moment, not for an instant, would the concentration slacken. It is an exercise, this, a training for high adventures of the soul. It is no light labor. The plowman's cleaving the furrows is easier by far. Five minutes of this effort will at first leave us trembling as at the close of a laborious day. It is then we realize how little of life has been our own and how much a response to sensation, a drifting on the tide of desire. Let us persevere and the turmoil increases and our whole being becomes vitalized, the bad as well as the good. The heat of this fervent concentration acts like fire under a pot, and everything in our being boils up madly. What man is there who thinks he has self-control? He stands in the shallow waters, nor has gone into the great deep, nor has been tossed at the mercy of the waves. But the ancients who taught us to gain this intensity taught it but as preliminary to a meditation which would not waver. The meditation they urged on us has been explained as the inexpressible yearning of the inner man to go out into the infinite. But that infinite we would enter is living. It is the ultimate being of us. Meditation is a fiery brooding on that majestic self. We imagine ourselves into its vastness we conceive ourselves as mirroring its infinitudes, as moving in all things, as living in all beings. We try to know it as it knows, to live as it lives, to be compassionate as it is compassionate. We equal ourselves to it, that we may understand it and become it. What a man thinks that he is. That is the old secret, said the wise. We have imagined ourselves into this pitiful dream of life. By imagination and will, we re-enter true being, becoming that we conceive of. On that path of fiery brooding, I entered. Like many mystics, A.E. was convinced that individual consciousness was but a tributary 
of the collective consciousness of humanity. In one of his early poems titled Deep Sleep, he wrote, and all my thoughts are throngs of living souls. In the whole body of his verse, he said, this was the line that carried the most meaning because unity is a fact in nature. Proper meditation would begin to unveil our divine origins. The deeper our union with our boundless self, A.E. affirmed, the closer our bond with seen and unseen persons, thus doing them incalculable good. He assured his lifelong friend, Kerry Ray, you will find yourself much closer to humanity in your inner nature than in your material contact with them. I felt this some few evenings ago, when within myself and far away the stir of the long imprisoned souls of men seemed to reach me. When we sink within ourselves, when we see most alone, in that solitude we may meet multitudes. In his short story, The Meditation of Ananda, Russell tells of a lone ascetic who hears of the most noble of all meditations ordained by the Buddha. It is that in which the mind imagines pervading one quarter of the world with thoughts of love unstinted, and so the second, and so the third, and so the fourth, and thus the whole wide world above, below, around and everywhere does he continue to pervade with heart of love far reaching, grown great and beyond measure. In Russell's tale, through this self-conscious attunement to boundless compassion, Ananda thereby inspires a king to release his enemy, a child to relieve the loneliness of a prisoner and a teacher and his disciples to share the sacred Dharma with an outcast leper. A thought is a real force. The universe was born out of divine thought. And man, when he really thinks or truly imagines an ideal, is setting real forces at work, which will finally bring about events and happenings in his life and the life of his country. So it comes. There are ties which bind us to people other than those whom we meet in everyday life. I think they are the most real ties, most important to understand. For if we let our lamp go out, some far away who had reached out in the dark and felt a steady will, a persistent hope, a compassionate love, may reach out once again in an hour of need and finding no support, may give way and fold the hands in despair. Often we allow gloom to overcome us and so hinder the bright rays of their passage. But would we do so? Would we do it so often if we thought that perhaps the sadness which besets us, we do not know why, was caused by some one drawing nigh us for comfort, whom our lethargy might make feel still more his helplessness, while our courage, our faith, might cause our light to shine in some other heart which as yet has no light of its own. A.E. found in Theosophy an additional confirmation of the intuitions he carried since his early teens. It was the conviction that every human soul was a king in pauper's clothing, a fallen god who had willingly abdicated its heavenly station, descending into the world of matter with the intention of remolding it uh, to a divine salvific pattern. Though the inevitable suffering the descent entails, or through it, rather, through that suffering, the elixir of a deeper, eventually perfected wisdom would be garnered. And this is why he said there would be, there is both a purgation and a sweetness that comes with suffering. His faith in this innate heroism and perfectibility of the human soul meant a reverence was due even towards the most mean and wretched of persons. All this was fundamental to his conception of the ideal of human brotherhood and sisterhood, which was the aspect of theosophy that always meant the most to him. In 1895, Russell discovered for the first time his Celtic heritage 
1878 and 1880, an Irish barrister named Standish O'Grady published two volumes titled A History of Ireland, a retelling of Celtic myths largely centered on the story of Cúhuláin, the greatest of the legendary Gaelic warriors. There was the soul of a people, its noblest and most exalted life, symbolized in the story of one heroic character. When I read O'Grady, I was as such a man who suddenly feels ancient memories rushing at him and knows he was born in a royal house, that he had mixed with the mighty of heaven and earth and had the very noblest for his companions. I felt exalted as one who learns he is among the children of kings. In The Secret Doctrine, H.P. Blavatsky drew upon many of the world's mythologies to demonstrate how a single, once universal cosmological science underlies them all. She does mention the ancient Celtic tradition, but without much detail. By 1895 AE, his imagination captivated by O'Grady's history began to follow her example, though without claiming any authority or finality. Articles on this topic began uh, appearing, uh, including the legends of the ancient Ire, Celtic cosmology, in the shadow of the gods, and many others, along with dozens of poems. The Ires confirm and help uh, clarify many of the correspondences that are suggested by AE. Uh, the boundless Lear, for example, the Celtic god of the ocean, is identified with the face of the deep of the gospels the Hindu Parabrahm, or one reality beyond all dualities. It is called Ein Sof in the Kabbalah, the chaos of Homer and Hesiod. It is also the night of time from which the Celtic sacred hazel, the tree of being, arises. The symbol of the great world tree is found in many traditions, such as the Ashvatha tree of Hinduism called Yggdrasil in Nordic mythology. The primordial children of the unknowable Lear, called Mananan, Dana, and Angus, correspond to the divine trinities found in many traditions, the triune aspects of the word or verbum, both precosmic and cosmic. Mananan was the father of the Celtic gods, the ancient of days, corresponding to primordial consciousness, the cosmic mind or Mahat of Hinduism, and for a E the divine imagination. It is Mananan who emanates seven divinities, the branches of the hazel tree of life. The sacred seven, also found in many traditions, are the primordial differentiations of a singular trunk called the Dhyanis in theosophical thought. They are said to be the agents of karmic and cosmic law, the intelligent noumenal causes emerging from their divine home to animate the entire hidden architecture of nature before becoming what we call visible nature. The Celtic Dana or Danu was the mother of the gods, collectively called Tuath de Danan, Old Irish for the peoples of the goddess Danu. Dana or Danu corresponds to the Greek Gaia and in, in her ultimate character, the Hindu Mulaprakriti, undifferentiated primordial substance, providing the material basis for all life forms. The Gnostic Sophia is Aditi Vak, also divine wisdom and the hidden properties of spiritual sound and light, inseparable from the third person of the Celtic triad, Angus. Angus at one level corresponds to the Tibetan Fohat, cosmic energy, the Greek Eros and Hindu Kamadeva. It is the Vedic principle of divine love, which first connects being with non-being and binds spirit to matter, heaven to earth on every plane. In the Gaelic myths, Angus Og is the Celtic spirit of love and beauty, whose golden harp draws away all persons to discover their own relation to deity. A.E. gave us a series of poetic names to this triune source of the great chain of being. He called it the Mag Magician of the Beautiful, the Mount of Transfiguration, and the Mighty Mother. 
in line with its innumerable aspects and personifications found in the tales of Celtic mythology, he saw it as the inexhaustible fountainhead of aesthetic expression, heroic action, and mystic illumination, giving rise to diverse expressions of creativity in the arts, religion, and philosophy. The search for its origin, summarized the Ayers, was A.E.'s hallowed mission as mystic and artist. Just as H.P.B. explained regarding the Greek and Hindu pantheons, A.E. taught that the Celtic gods are not only universal metaphysical abstractions, they are also ever active potencies in human and cosmic evolution, as well as beings who descend into incarnation as avatars, adept kings and queens, sages, heroes, and spiritual teachers. This descent of the gods was allegorically depicted in the various cycles of Celtic mythology recorded in medieval texts, though degraded from their origins in the oral traditions of the Druidic bards. Like the Hindu Rama and Krishna, such godlike beings appear at critical turning points in human history in order to overcome the forces of darkness and ignorance threatening to envelop humanity and to guide the wheel of evolution towards universal enlightenment, quote, revealing the spiritual character of the race to itself, unquote. A.E. became convinced that Ireland was as sacred as India or Tibet, one of the pivots on which mankind's spiritual destiny had turned and was destined to soon turn again. After his first visit to the United States in 1928, he felt the same about America. And in the following passage, uh, when the word airy is mentioned, he, of course, he's referring to Ireland. A, a form of Erin, right? The genius of the Gale is awakening after a night of troubled dreams. It returns instinctively to the beliefs of its former day and finds again the old inspiration. It seeks the gods on the mountains, still enfolded by their mantle of multitudinous traditions, or sees them flash by in the sunlit diamond airs. How strange, but how natural is all this. Hence it may be the delight with which we hear Standish O'Grady declaring that the bardic divinities will remain, quote, nor, after centuries of obscuration, is their power to quicken, purify, and exalt yet dead. Still they live and reign, and shall reign. After long centuries, the voice of a spirit ever youthful, yet older than all the gods, who with his breath of sunrise-colored flame jewels with richest lights the visions of Earth's dreamy-hearted children, no other voice has power to lure. There remain only the long heroic labors, which end in companionship with the gods. These voices do not stand for themselves alone. They are heralds before a host. No man has ever spoken with potent utterance who did not feel the secret urging of the dumb, longing multitudes, whose aspirations and wishes converge on and pour themselves into the fearless heart. The thunder of waves is deeper because the tide is rising. Those who are behind do not come only with song and tale, but with stern hearts bent on great issues, among which, not least, is the intellectual liberation of Ireland. That is an aim at which some of our rulers may well grow uneasy. Soon shall young men, fiery-hearted, children of Erie, a new race, roll out their thoughts on the hillsides before your very doors, O oh priests, calling your flocks from your dark chapels and twilight sanctuaries to a temple not built with hands, sunlit, starlit, sweet with the odor and incense of earth. From your altars, call them to the altars of the hills, soon to be lit up as of old. These heroes I see emerging have they not come forth in every land and race when there was need? Here, too, they will arise. Ah, my darlings, you will have to fight and suffer. You must endure loneliness, the coldness of friends, the alienation of love, warmed only by 
the bright interior hope of a future you must toil for but may never see. Letting the deed be done its own reward. Laying in dark places the foundations of that high and holy area of prophecy, the Isle of Enchantment, burning with druidic splendors, bright with immortal presences, with the face of the everlasting beauty looking in upon all its ways, divine with terrestrial mingling, till God and the world are one. There waits brooding in this isle a great destiny. And to accomplish it, we must have freedom of thought. That is the greatest of our needs. For thought is the lightning conductor between the heaven world and earth. But this high spirit is stifled everywhere by a dull infallibility which is yet unsuccessful on its own part in awakening inspiration. There are despotic hands in politics, in religion, in education, strangling any attempt at freedom. With the young men who throng the literary societies, the intellectual future of Ireland rests. In them are our future leaders. Out of these, as from a fountain, will spring what? Will we have another generation of Irishmen at the same level as today with everything in a state of childhood, boyish patriotism, boyish ideals, boyish humor? Or will they assimilate the aged thought of the world and apply it to the needs of their own land? I remember reading somewhere a description by Turgenev of his contemporaries as a young man, how they sat in garrets drinking ex execrably bad coffee and tea. Oh, but what thoughts! They talked of God, of humanity, of holy Russia. And out of such groups of young men, out of their discussions, emanated that vast unrest which has troubled Europe and will trouble it still more. What is the ideal of Ireland as a nation? It drifts from mind to mind, a phantom thought lacking a spirit, but a spirit which will surely incarnate. Meanwhile, we must fight for intellectual freedom. We must strive to formulate to ourselves what it is we really wish for here, until at last the ideal becomes no more phantasmal but living until our voices and aspiration are heard in every land and the nations become aware of a new presence amid their councils, a last and most beautiful figure, as one after the cross of pain, after the shadowy terrors, with thorn marks on the brow from a crown flung aside, but now radiant, ennobled after suffering, airy, the love of so many dreamers, priestess of the mysteries, with the chant of beauty on her lips and the heart of nature beating in her heart. At the end of the 19th century, two monstrous issues racked the Irish countryside, poverty and faction. The Great Famine of the 1840s was still a living memory, and large-scale emigration had dwindled the population to about half its pre-famine level. The bulk of the population worked the land and tried to make a meager living by farming inefficiently on tiny plots. Many of them lived in small cottages and some in one-room mud or stone cabins with a single window. Some shared their homes with farm animals, even pigs and cattle. A journey to the nearest small town did little to brighten peasant life. Devoid of culture, such villages had nothing to offer but drab, dirty streets, shops meagerly stocked with a jumble of overpriced goods and the false solace of a public house. The poverty was greatly aggravated by fierce antagonisms, both economic and religious. While the bulk of the land was owned by a Protestant aristocracy, most of the tenants, except in Ulster, were Catholic. While the proximate cause of the great starvation had been a, pot a potato pl blight that infected crops throughout Europe, 
The longer-term cause in Ireland was the narrow-sighted policy of wealthy British absentee landlords who insisted on a crop of potatoes only in order to maximize profits. Once the potato went bad, there was little else to eat. The question of home rule thus often dominated political discourse. Sir Horace Corazon Plunkett was an Anglo-Irish Oxford graduate who devoted his adult life to the service of his countrymen. His altruistic devotion made it easy to see why he and A.E. should have been mutually attracted. Plunkett was well aware that land reform alone would not make the small farmer prosperous. The typical Irish farmer was technically backward in both method and finance practices. So were the country shopkeepers on whom they depended. Plunkett warned that the Gombe man, uh, the moneylender, who was usually also a shopkeeper, would replace the greedy landlord. Instead, he sought to establish a series of small community-based Raffaisen cooperatives. Frederick Raffaisen founded the first rural credit union in 1864 in Flammersfeld, Germany. Motivated by the misery of the poor during the winter famine of 1846-47, he founded a community-built bakery and distributed bread on credit to the poorest amongst the population. This was not simple charity, but benevolent assistance. Credit meant that the poor would also need to assist with bread making or other labor in payment. Raffleson was convinced that in order to fight poverty, one should fight dependency first. Based on this idea, he came up with the three S formula, self-help, self-governance, and self-responsibility. This applied to the policy of communal microlending as well. The Raffeson system became the basis of co-op banking all over Europe, America, and eventually India. In, 18, in 1894, Plunkett founded the Irish Agricultural Organization Society, IAOS, to promote the development of, of such cooperative institutions in rural Ireland. He soon, soon began to feel that its greatest benefits were moral. Catholics and Protestants, nationalists and unionists were beginning to work harmoniously together in the cooperative societies and members were becoming more self-reliant and self-confident, taking a new pride in their country. In 1897, A.E. accepted a position under Plunkett, fully concurring in his aims and ideals, and was determined to work for human brotherhood through the cooperative movement. Two other students of the Hermetic Society also took employment in the IOAS as well. Along with organizing on behalf of communal material welfare, Russell sought a cultural renewal through rural education. In his eyes, this was inseparable from a true spiritual revival centered on Gaelic ancient history and folklore. These were no fairy tales at all, he was convinced, but druidic wisdom clothed in story, still rich with the mysteries of nature, with moral ideals and nobilities that would lift the spirit. Revived through literature, art, and theater, knowledge of Ireland's ancient heritage could be made available to the poor. In this way, he was convinced he would help prepare Irish men and women for the great destiny which awaited them. Russell accepted only a small salary for his commitment, claiming that no man deserved more for his labor. Already well-versed in business methods, A.E. mastered the principles of communal credit uh, without difficulty and set off for Mayo in December of 1897 at a time when only three credit banks existed in Ireland. Years later, using the editorial we, he wrote an account of his first formal encounter with the peasants of the West. We prepared our first cooperative speech with great care and delivered it with fervor and, as we believed, eloquence to an audience of male farmers and sat down flushed and expectant of many converts. Well, out of the brooding silence rose the parish priest who put matters straight. 
What he means to say is that if any of you want a pound to buy a young pig's, he can get a loan of it by paying one penny. <laughs> and he went on to reduce our eloquence to simple English. That was a never-to-be-forgotten lesson. It was that boiling down of our remarks which created the society in that district. Never again did we strive to be eloquent when organizing. <laughs> A.E.'s early fury against the priests was softened by his discovery of the loving care with which the Irish clergy of all denominations ministered to the needs of the poorest parishioners. With their assistance, Russell became a beloved prophet of the cooperatives, traveling each year all over Ireland. Along with a keen understanding of the practicalities, he always emphasized that the basis of the cooperative movement quote, was the divine law of brotherhood. And if each lent a hand to each, the industrial redemption of Ireland would be a certainty, unquote. Thirteen years later, there were over 900 cooperative societies in Ireland, representing over 100,000 members, and 300 agri agricultural credit banks with an annual turnover of 3.3 million pounds, uh, that's over 100 million pounds in today's currency, 13 years. Besides devising unique plans for district cooperatives, counseling their establishment and maintenance, AE later envisioned a day when the whole of Ireland would be united in a great commonwealth. Within each district, individuals would develop a deep sense of local community while sharing an intensity of life such as had existed in the city-states of ancient Greece and medieval Italy. At the same time, each district would be linked in a vast network of such cooperatives, allowing for both socialist and capitalistic enterprise. Though the Irish cooperatives were adamantly apolitical, AE envisioned them as a basis of a harmonic system wherein a democratically elected central parliament would arbitrate when separate interests clashed, would rule in other fields, and would remain uh, or would maintain the personal liberty of citizens. The greatest need of a democracy, he felt, was for a respected elite, an aristocracy based on merit, on clarity and brightness of intellect, altruistic insight, and purity of moral character for authentic voices that could speak and inspire on behalf of the whole. And he believed that this model was one that was in line with that which had been established by the ancient Gaelic clans. Despite the immediate successes, this was grueling work with travel by open carriage or by foot without healthy meals or a clean place to rest. But Russell was seeking to reawaken the latent soul force of a nation, still flickering in the heart of many a peasant. Occasionally, Russell also encountered comic incidents. In one case, a man asked for a loan from the credit union in order to buy a suit. When the democratically elected committee appointed to decide on such matters warned that this was not productive, the young farmer explained that it would result in his marrying a girl who owned two acres a pig and 25 pounds. <laughs> he was given the loan. In 1908, H.F. Norman, a co-worker in the co-op movement, hearing a E address a meeting of about 40 farmers in County Cavan, observed the following, quote, the spare figure bent above a listening audience to whom listening seems indeed an unwanted activity. As he diagnoses for, for them their common economic infirmity, patiently and simply expounding the technique of the remedy, his face is grave and taut, eloquent the message, but never rhetorical, though now at a close, as his voice ascends to its treble notes, he is appealing to these rough-handed, dark-visaged, somber, realistic, unprosperous men of the spade and hoe to think rather of each other and of their mutual hopes and difficulties than of their own several toils and needs. The audience sits tense, rapt, 
elevated. His dream of brotherhood descends on them. They rise to it. When he ends, there is a relief of emotional tension, an intake of deep breath, such as follows the close of a big symphony. Some peasants once missed the church service on a minor festival in order to hear A.E. speak, and one of them made the excuse to the parish priest. Sure, and wasn't we doing just as good as to be at Mass, listening as we was to George's sermon? <laughs> the priest who told the story concluded by admitting, And in the name of God, I think they were. Horace Plunkett wrote of A.E., quote, I have never seen such a natural self-effacement, and this for the service of humanity. Upon no scheme of compensation here or hereafter, he outdreams us all. Russell also thrilled in befriend befriending farming families who, like himself, could sometimes glimpse the elemental fairies and the immortal presences in their midst. On one occasion, a handsome old farmer named Caden Moore told him how in his youth he had spent a night in a fairy palace underneath Mount Nephin, and how he had once seen Queen Maeve, whom he called the beauty of all beauty, a local personification of the earth goddess representing the sacred isle itself. This inspired A.E.'s lilting poem, The Gates of Dreamland. It's a lonely road through Bogland to the lake at Carrymore, and a sleeper there lies dreaming where the water laps the shore. Though the moth wings of the twilight and their purple are unfurled, yet his sleep is filled with music by the masters of the world. Though your Colleen's heart be tender, a tenderer heart is near. What's the starlight of her glances when the stars are shining here? Who would kiss the fading shadow when the flower face glows above? Tis the beauty of all beauty that is calling for your love. Oh, the mountain gates of dreamland have opened once again, and the sound of song and dancing falls upon the ears of men. And the land of youth lies gleaming, lit with rainbow light and mirth, and the old enchantment lingers in the honey heart of earth. In an article in which he uh, contained this poem, um, A.E. addresses the reader and says, is this dream or is this real? And then he gives the reply. Do not ask me too strictly. All things are dream, save only the spirit which gazes on the phantasmagoria. And those dreams endure most, which most fitly accord with its immortality. After only a few months, Plunkett realized that A.E.'s extraordinary abilities fitted him for more than the founding of credit banks, and he now appointed him assistant secretary to the organization in the Dublin office. In 1905, this led to him becoming the editor of the Irish Homestead, a nonprofit weekly newspaper founded by Plunkett which served to disseminate both world news and cooperative news, rural science and technical details of progressive farming practices. The editorship was an exacting task and AE transformed it into a more broadly educative one. Increasingly, it included poems and short stories, historic or mythic, along with commentary on cultural events. In time, the newspaper grew to an international readership George Bernard Shaw called it the best weekly paper of its kind in the world. When government and advertising funding subsided in 1923, the homestead evolved into the Irish Statesman, also a weekly paper which went on for another seven years. Besides articles by Russell, contributors included the best in then contemporary Irish writing, including poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. In these pages, A.E. solidified his international acclaim, not only as spokesman of the agricultural cooperatives, 
but as a leading intellect, creative idealist, wise connoisseur of world culture, and voice of the national conscience. In addition, besides Plunkett, A.E. found himself in company with President Theodore Roosevelt, the Russian anarchist Kropotkin, as well as both Gandhi and Tolstoy, all who were seeking a humane alternative to the grim machine-like society based on urban industry. Russell pointed to an awful warning, the life of Britain's industrial masses, a life further off from beauty, he wrote, more remote from spirit, more alien from deity than that led by any people hitherto in the memory of the world. In June 1888, Russell had taken an hour off of work to marry Violet North, <laughs> a poet, mystic, and devoted student of theosophy. So little publicity was given to the occasion that when Yeats met the couple a few days later, A.E. casually announced, by the way, I may as well tell you we were married. In the years following, the couple gave birth to four children, two of whom tragically died in childhood. With all this going on, A.E.'s family home was at the same time becoming one of the intellectual hubs of Dublin, a city which was on the threshold of a period so brilliantly creative that it is almost legendary. Despite incessant travel to attend cooperative meetings throughout Ireland and his work as editor while also painting and writing both poetry and prose, A.E. was tirelessly active in several literary, dramatic, and artistic circles in Dublin and still running the Hermetic Society. It was in these circles, wrote Summerfield, that the embryo of a new Ireland was being born. While A.E. enjoyed both friendship and opposition from some of the brightest minds and mature writers like Yeats and James Joyce, Lady Gregory and Alistair Clark, he also gathered round him a circle of young men and women who were just discovering the pleasure of putting words together. To these poets in the making, he was mystic, prophet, schoolmaster, and companion. From the testimony of the many who benefited A.E.'s generosity in suggesting ideas, subjects, and plots to other writers was boundless, and he never revealed what he had contributed to their works. Both his office and home became places of pilgrimage for innumerable travelers, Irish and foreign, statesmen, artists, playwrights, and farmers who wished to meet the, quote, formidably accomplished but invariably approachable sage, unquote. In a country seething with many hatreds, men who were irreconcilable political enemies met peacefully there. On Sunday nights in the Russell's crowded living room, ideas of all kinds, economic, political, mystical, and literary, were freely discussed and intertwined. Um, the discourse uh, we're told, would continue through into the early hours of the morning. Lloyd Power, an author and art critic for the Irish Times, declared that A.E. was, quote, the best, the wisest, and wittiest talker I ever listened to in Paris, London, or elsewhere. His mind seemed to be a fountain of fire casting beauty up everlastingly into the air. An attempt to summarize the historic changes that took place in Ireland, Europe, and America in the last 22 years of Russell's life would be far beyond the scope of this forum. This would include events leading up to the establishment of the first national theater in Ireland, the Dublin lockout, the First World War, the Easter Rising, the Irish War of Independence, and the founding of the Irish state. In his book on this period, uh, published in 2003 by Nicholas Allen. Uh, it's titled uh, George Russell, A.E. and the New Ireland, 1905 to 1930. Uh, he traces the impact of Russell's ever-flowing waterfall of ideas and keen observations. In an, era in an era prior to radio and television where pamphlets, periodicals, and books were the most effective means of widespread public influence, he finds A.E.'s voice as writer and editor to be focused upon 
and impacting every major controversy. Even prior to World War I, A.E. realized the commonwealth he envisioned would not be realized in his lifetime. Deeply opposed to violence as a form of conflict resolution, he watched while much of what he helped to build was destroyed by his countrymen. He became quite certain that the spirit of the modern world and modern education will soon put an end to the folk imagination and the folk memory. After that, the farmer's boy will be thinking of scientific farming, and his literature will be the modern novel and the daily newspaper. In late July 1914, A.E. declared that the fate of Europe depended upon a handful of mediocrities. Yeah a handful of mediocrities, ignorant middlemen, he said, posing as leaders who perhaps wielded the power of life and death over civilization itself. He reflected, When people have no clear conception of a social order or a peculiar civilization to be built up and are maneuvered into a conflict which may result in the destruction of such forms of civilization as they possess, it seems to us that the struggle is like a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. 48 hours after these words were published, Germany invaded Belgium. And a day later, on August 4th, the United Kingdom declared war on Germany. As Ireland sunk into chaos, Russell turned his attention and hopes towards America, his last trip to the U.S. occurring just weeks before he passed away. As William Penn wrote, they that love beyond the world cannot be separated by it. Death cannot kill what never dies. Russell never lost faith in the ideals and living mystic realities which he found at the roots of life, buried beneath the veils of the visible twilight. His visionary experiences in the Irish hills, in the halls of Penns, and in deep meditation convinced him that the cosmic forces and immortal heroes which the ancient bards, rishis, and seers intimated are ever-present and can make themselves known to the inner eye of the receptive mind and heart. Sustained by a boundless love and perpetual fountainhead of beauty, truth, and goodness, they will rise again, he believed, to move our souls, to help give birth to civilizations yet unguessed. In the midst of World War I, A.E. published his eighth book of poetry called Gods of War, echoing the affirmation that Blavatsky had made regarding the periodical renewal of ancient wisdom. The final poem ends with a plea for such an incarnation before the world enters the longest, darkest portion of the Kali Yuga or the Dark Age. Send forth who promised long ago I will not leave thee or forsake someone to whom our hearts may flow with adoration, though we make the crucifixion be the sign, the meed of all the kingly line. The morning stars were heard to sing when man towered golden in his prime. One equal memory let us bring before we face our night in time. Grant us one only evening star the Iron Age's avatar. Oliver Gogarty was a lifelong friend, poet, author, and later senator of an independent Ireland who, along with P.L. Travers, came to Russell's bedside in his final days as he was dying from cancer. Gogarty called Russell the angelic anarchist and was irresistibly reminded of the death of Socrates, and he wrote the following. His calm fortitude, his lovableness, made even his surgeon, whose skill must defend itself against sentimentality, turn away for a moment in tears. His friends were brokenhearted, but he was unmoved. The change in his countenance was remarkable, and the way the mind threw off the veils of death 
to deepen the great blue light in the eyes as he rejoiced at seeing for a moment a friend's face was something to impress the memory forever. The hero in the man looked out and it was his friends who had to brace themselves against life with its loss. Questions? So he was somewhat appalled by the modernization that took place in the what, 1920s and 30s. How do you think he would look at uh, society today? What would be, uh, what would be the, the stars or what would be the ray of hope that he would see in today's culture, do you think? Wow, that's, that's a difficult question and one that I never really tried to sort out. Um, there's a lot. I, I'm sure he would find a lot of good uh, undercurrents um, uh, in our day. And, and that's, that's a, you know, as a brief answer to it, because we really don't know, of course, but that one of the remarkable things that was despite the tremendous destruction and the overwhelming uh, might of the Industrial Revolution and the, um, the, the, the violent chaos that was erupting in Ireland in his day uh, for independence and which had been brooding for a long time and all of that, he was, he was tuned to the spiritual undercurrents and could see and, and felt deeply, deeply felt that, that the, the, um, the life of humanity, its deepest life, its spiritual life, would eventually overcome all the, the, the surface um, chaos um, that was erupting. In fact, you know, that is part of the legend, um, the, part of the Gaelic legends that as the you could say the um, adverse forces began to gain dominance of the earth. The gods retired to the, the underworld. And that's why these uh, um, great mounds <clears throat> are revered uh, in Ireland because they're believed to be the habitations of the immortals. And, he, and this is, you know, as we heard in the first readings, he, he had a, you know, a living sense of that being true and that, you know, the golden age had never passed away. It was there, you know, it's waiting for us to awaken to it. Yes? There's a, oh, it's a question in the back here, but you'll be next. Um, there was an expression, the true home of man, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps something that A.E. referred to that he was looking for, or seeking to describe. And I just wondered if you think of something that typified that in his mind or even uh, think of a, one of his works that speaks to that, the idea of the true home of man. Yes, uh, well, that's very much connected with what we were just saying. Uh, and also this idea of dreamland, right? So he's kind of raising the question for us. You know, those, those glimpses that we have of our own divinity, the divinity of others, the divinity in nature, we tend to pass them off because we more often live in a world where we're bound by just the physical senses and, and uh, a mind that, you know, has certain ambitions, desires, uh, 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 identifies with, uh, with the, the body and, and the... Um, you know, the, its, its needs and so on. But the, but the true home of man is that immortal golden age. Uh, that's where um, we, we enter in, in deep sleep each night. And that's another reason why you get the metaphor of the dreamland is because in that passage, he believed, 
into sleep, we actually enter into concert with those beings and with that part of ourself which is consonant with those uh, immortals, uh, those, those, those uh, universal principles in nature which work to the true sustenance uh, of the good of, of, of humanity and of all of nature. They're continually at work uh, of, on behalf of the whole. So that's where, the, where our true home lies. But of course, we've, we've separated ourselves from it, um, again, by um, our concerns on behalf of some limited sense of identity, whether that's our, our tribe, our uh, nationality, our skin color, our, our nation, and on and on. So I think that would be one way to describe it anyway. And Joe, if you have, you want to uh, respond to any of these, please uh, let us know. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I, when you said about the Irish deities uh, going to the mounds and the underworld and things like that, from a Jungian perspective, that is returning to the deep unconscious. Mm -hmm. And something that goes to the deep unconscious doesn't disappear. It awaits time to come back again. Mm -hmm. So, right, uh, yeah. right. That's, uh, that's One a, thing I was surprised mm. about, you never mentioned, I ca from all his history and so on, he was also deeply entwined with Modgon, the woman Yeats was in love with. Mm. And Yeats proposed marriage to her for 28 years, and she wouldn't marry him <laughs> because she knew she was a muse. And if she married him, he would lose his muse. And he would complain and moan and everything, and she'd say, but... You're happy, he'd say, I'm miserable without you. And she would say, but you're happy with the poetry you write. And then she said, the world would thank me that I don't marry you. And she's right, because he wrote the, all this magnificent love poetry to her. <laughs> but another thing about her is that she had a, a love child. And um, uh, that little boy grew up to be the founder of Amnesty International, the same mm -hmm. woman, and people don't realize it was the same extraordinary woman. Mm -hmm. So i just like to, but I'm sure he knew her very well because she was yeah. part of the Hermetic Order uh, and all the places you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, she mm -hmm. was there mm -hmm. as well. There's yeah. so many yeah. really remarkable people, people that kind of yeah. emerged out of it. You know, yeah. we, that, that's yeah. one thing that we weren't very conscious of before we started the study. There, yeah. uh, this woman named Lady Gregory, who I'm, yeah. I'm sure you know exactly. about, who yeah. learned Irish, That's right. Yeah. taught yeah. herself yeah. Irish, and started to translate the old medieval texts, you know, line by line. Yeah. <laughs> and she right. used the, uh, uh, I think it was a translation of the Bible as kind of a guide to, to, in, in uh, deciphering words, but she also, which Standish O'Grady didn't do. Standish yeah. O'Grady put it into kind of very flowery, elaborate language, yeah. but she put it into these very simply understood tales yeah. Yeah. that then were made into plays. She was also a playwright, you know, um, and was very much part of the, the rebirth of the Irish theater or the mm -hmm. birth of it, mm -hmm. the National Theater. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's so many characters like that. that yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, what a lot of people don't realize that today, Ireland is the richest country in the European Union. I've heard that. Three yeah. times richer than the Netherlands and yeah. also richer than Germany or France. But it's dubious. And it's a dubious richness. And the second, <laughs> the second right? richest... You, you want to comment on that? It's because there's still tremendous poverty, right? So the common people are not benefiting. Well, they are now more. Are they? I think, okay. Yeah, I think okay. definitely nothing like we saw. In, mm -hmm. uh, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, they all get a very good education. Uh, the healthcare is burdened because the, you know, the population has expanded. You know, when I grew up in Ireland, it was 2.9 million. Now it's 5 million, I think, and and that's quite a short space of time. So the infrastructures haven't been able to develop. Hospitals and all these things are clamoring to keep up with the all the people coming to work there from all over the world, mm. you know, and uh, it's the richest country in the European Union and the second richest in Europe. Yes. Only Germany, at least, sorry, Norway being richer based on the GDP. Yeah. Mm. And they also have a lot of money now to do things they never could do when they were in survival. And a lot of money has been spent on um, archaeological 
digging because they have found massive amounts of um, Neolithic sites in Ireland mm -hmm. that will require excavation eventually, mm -hmm. and also genetic research. And they're finding all sorts of uh, very, very interesting things just now on the genetic research that um, they found that there were people living in Ireland 33,000 years ago. They were black-skinned, very dark-skinned, or black-skinned with blue eyes. And these people were also found in Denmark, Norway, um, Sweden, England, Denmark, and the Netherlands. But Southern Europe do not have this uh, genetic code. So that's one thing they found. There was also a very, very big invasion to Ireland from Anatolia in the fifth century, um, which also would have brought some of that Eastern mysticism with it and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, that's sort of, that was all the animals in Ireland are genetically Anatolian, the cows, the pigs. So they obviously brought the animals. And then there was another big invasion from Russia. The Seps came to Ireland. And then the Beakers and the Vikings. And the Viking uh, uh, occupation was much bigger than they ever expected. Mm -hmm. But the Celts didn't get to Ireland. They were on mainland Europe. And the reason the Irish were speaking the Celtic language was for trading reasons, not because they had become Celtic, or uh, certainly they're not genetically Celtic. So that's very new information coming out from all this re genetic research being done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. So it's Thank interesting. you. So it's, it's, every every year there's new things being discovered. They're now exploring caves in the west of Ireland that have never been um, seen by human beings because they're under the burren. I don't know if you know the burren. It's uh, limestone, and under the limestone are water caves which no human has ever been to. And the, the, the limestone is 330 million years old. <laughs> so, and at that time, it was, it was below the equator. So there was some platonic shift well, that brought do you, it up. Do you, you know what? H.P. Blavatsky, in the Sorry? secret... H.P. Blavatsky, who I mentioned? Yeah, Blavatsky. In the secret yeah. doctrine, yeah. she says that the British Isles, in fact, are a remnant of what is the myth of Atlantis, the sinking of Atlantis. It's, it's one of the few yeah. land masses that yeah, are yeah. still above the yeah. water yeah, yeah, from yeah. those ancient, yeah. very, very, very ancient days of yeah. humanity. Well, so that's very interesting. They well, now they're beginning to uh, explore these water caves. Mm, wow. Yeah. Thank you. So I noticed in all of this, there's no religion. <laughs> it's very um, archetypal, heady stuff. Yet Ireland, present Ireland, is, you know, Christian. Catholics fighting Protestants. Why did, how is it possible <clears throat> that he missed that? Or Oh, he didn't miss it. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't see anything, though. Well, I, I, okay. All I heard was poetry <laughs> and heady, very way above my pay grade. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that's a big topic, and thank you for mentioning it. By the way, uh, we we didn't we made a conscious decision to kind of not, um, you know, deal with it so much because it's a sensitive subject for people who may be Christian. Because he, in this, uh, one of the readings that I think you will remember, Joe read so beautifully, by the way. I'm just so magnificent. Yep. Thanks, uh, Joe. Joe, really <laughs> can't thank you enough for that. Really made the day. Um, he, he saw the, the Christian faith, whether Catholic or Protestant, as as an, a, a, a faith, a, a religion that had been imposed on Ireland from, from, by foreign power. And this is, you know, it's known to history, right? St. Patrick is honored as the one who brought the Christian faith to Ireland. But Ireland had a religion. Ireland had a faith, a very deep and wonderful faith. And that's recorded, uh, although, you know, somewhat distorted. And again, we just kind of just passed over this a little. But it's recorded in medieval texts 
uh, that had not been, they were in the Old Irish, had not been translated into English. And so even, but even before he knew about that, because he didn't know about it, it was discovered during his day. And the translations were just beginning during his day. That was this whole thing about uh, Standish O'Grady and the history of Ireland. The history of Ireland is not a, a like a chronological history. It's a story of the mythical basis of Ireland, which is its inherent religion. That's what he believed. And, uh, but it was, it's a spirituality, right? It's not a faith imposed on the outside. It's something that emerges from the heart. But, but uh, in any case, so he, he, in his view, the Christian faith was imposed upon the Irish people and was a constriction on it. It was a, it was a dogmatic faith that didn't um, nurture the spirit, the true spirit. And in fact, the whole, in, he, in many of his articles, he goes back to this theme again and again, hammers on Christianity, <laughs> because they, he, he says that the, it engenders a fear of death, for one. And it engenders a fear in believing in anything else, mm. right? Because if you don't believe, you're going to go to hell, yeah. right? That's, that's the thing. That's the threat. That's the threat Christianity used to, to, dominate, fa to dominate people. And, and to, uh, but just one more point. And so, th so that um, at the same time, he believed that just as there, there, that there was an underlying esot esoteric tradition within Christianity. So he went back to the New Testament and he found, once he had sort of begun to understand that these mystic perceptions he had were actually part of a universal tradition. And this is what, uh, but through the study of Blavatsky, he started to found, find was that every great uh, religious or spiritual tradition had these underlying universal ideas. And so he, he started to see those again in the New Testament. So he went back and he started writing about the Christos, right? Because you, I don't know if you heard me mention that, but it, it was towards the beginning. But he linked it up to other traditions that, as well. So he said the true Christos was really that connected up with the, the tale of Prometheus, in, in the Greek tradition. It's the descent of the divine into human form and the awakening of the human mind. But anyway, those are a few thoughts. Joe? No, that's all I was going to say. Is he, yeah. was, he was inspired. Um, he, he did. He was inspired by a kind of archetypal or Gnostic Christianity. There's those, that wonderful line from his, resonant lines from his um, The Hero and Man. I think he begins... Christ is incarnate in all humanity. Prometheus is bound forever within us. They are a host, and the divine incarnation was not spoken of one, but of all those who descended from the world of light to wrest out of chaos a kingdom. You know, so. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Did that address your question? You wanted to say something else as well? So there is no... Wait one second, please. We've got to get you on the mic here so everyone can hear. So there's no God, there's universe, <laughs> there's mother nature, no. there's poetry. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah. No, there's... Whereas the religion, there's a God. Well, They no, focus no. on a God. No, no. Well, in, in A, know, do, you want, do you want to comment on that, Robert? Because you know well, A's writing. Yeah, but you can't confuse like a personal God with spirit spirit See, to, is universal and god me, is to me robert those are semantical things because the oh. the, my, the the human has a uh, a god or a thought of a god or a thought of religion or a thought of the universe yeah the yeah. creator yeah. is would would uh, russell think there's a creator he would as we tried to point out in that explanation about the three, the, the, yeah. the triune Which I uh, deities. I the bottom one, by the way. The What's full, that? The fomat? Fohat. Fohat, yeah. Spirit. It's a Tibetan word yeah. that many people are not familiar with. Yeah, I'm not. But it's, it's uh, and it, it has many levels of meaning to it, but one, a simple, Spiritual. straightforward, divine love. The love which brings the cosmos into being. And so, so everything is pervaded by that. And that's where you could talk about that as being our true, the true home of man, right? Yeah, but so no, this is part of what's so remarkable about A.E. is that he had this very a living sense of the divine, the, the reality 
of God in nature. And he referred to God in nature. He referred to the, the word deity. Uh, and, he ref and he saw beings who to him were godlike beings. And, 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 and but united in a single essence. You know, they were pointed to the, you know, the unity of all, of all humanity, of all nature, but in a living sense. You know, so it was like it was like a fleshing out of all those conception conceptualities. That's what mystic experience does. It goes beyond that all those concepts that we hold in regards to the divine, and it becomes an experience, a direct cognition, direct experience of the divine. That's what was, you know, so thunderous for him, which he, you know, from an early age, from, from being a teenager, he was, but they were momentary glimpses, right? And so he, afterwards, he would look back, you know, what did that mean? Were they real, you know, or was I dreaming? You know, what's going on there? But as he went on, he started to see, no, he was seeing something true and real to him. No. no. Well, I, I think you've uh, kind of hit on this in, in various comments, but um, the idea in the article that he wrote, The Hero in Man, yeah. could you say something about what the hero is and is it connected with the heart? Yeah. What is the hero in man? In that, you know? Well, uh, again, it's very much linked with what we've been talking about, and um, as far as I understand it. But the, I think the additional uh, aspect that you can add to it is like uh, the description of uh, the meditation of Ananda, that it, it, it is also... It, it's, it's, it's focus and it's intent, it's magnificence is that it, it's, it's living on behalf of the other. It's, and, it, and it's a transformative agent for the other. It's, it's, um, it's the heroic, um, that which in any situation, whether it's you know, uh, helping someone that you see is trying to get across the street and can't make it, or has stumbled and needs help getting up. It's that, imp it's that genuine impulse, selfless impulse in any human being that, that is moved to act on behalf of another. Yeah, I think that's one way to think about it. But of course, it has so many applications. Yeah. Uh, perhaps later, we're going to bring the meeting to a close, but that doesn't mean we, if you stick around, you can't have further discussion. <laughs> but we do want to get the vote of thanks in. Jerry Lewin's going to do that. Well, <clears throat> before we give the vote of thanks, just a bit of a reminder, if you haven't already picked up flyers for our coming programs, um, the ancient Maya and their forest, a co-creative landscape is here November 4th, 2 to 4. And we're going to be really lucky because we have are going to have Annabelle Ford the, from the Department of Anthropology at UC Santa Barbara, who's just done a humongous amount of research, super interesting, about the people um, that she'll be talking about and the, in the Maya forest of El Pilar. So that should be really fascinating. And then on um, November 18th, 2 to 4, we have this wonderful musician, Drew Tretnik, coming, and he, Tretik, and it's called a classical violinist odyssey. <clears throat> and if you've ever heard his music, it is divine. I'm not kidding at all. It's so, so beautiful. I really hope everybody can come. Um, so just a little reminder, we have some flyers back there you can take if you'd like. Um, now tonight, or today, we um, have had such a feast of ideas, haven't we? Um, we have heard from Kurt Gradine, uh, just an, a wonderful compilation from this immense thorough study that you can tell he spent so much time on and months doing this, along with so many other things. So we want to extend our gratitude from the Institute to you, Kirk, for your amazing sharing of ideas, and also to Joe Miller here, who so beautifully drew out the meaning of those passages, don't you think, mm -hmm. as he read those. And for me, that, that just um, went so well together with the two of you. 
Um, so since there's so much that happened, we can only touch on a few highlights, but I know we'll be able to come back and watch it later on YouTube, and that's always fun. But Kirk really illustrated that mysticism is not a vague and passive kind of endeavor. He showed that through the life of George William Russell, a deep search and discipline was really part of this whole mystical path. And that would be a continuing search and a deepening of discipline throughout his whole life. And um, the key to it all has been said to be an altruistic motive through all this work that he did. Kirk also showed us that the imagination is the link between mystic vision and social responsibility. That George William Russell translated his spiritual vision into you know, the service of humanity in so many ways, but especially during the Irish Renaissance and the land reform movement. Um, so what we have come to see here through this beautiful talk and so beautifully illustrated with the slides and the art um, is that the transcendental vision of the mystic can be reflected in daily life through art, poetry, writing, and through the service of humanity in, in the development even of this, this character that just really influenced so many people. So Kirk really has been a candle shedding light on these ideas to us such that we can take this and perpetuate these thoughts and continue this study ourselves. And these higher ideas, when looked at and taken at every level of being from abstract to concrete, we can see that this brings harmony to all, which is our our natural being. So join me in thanking Kirk and Joe for this beautiful experience. Thank you.